This morning I wanted to share um, about the importance of our global church family. It's going to include a little bit of who we are as the Brethren in Christ and some of the reasons as to why we think it's important to spread ourselves around the world. There are many different places that I thought about going, some of the key passages like the Great Commission where it says go and make disciples or Acts 1-8 where he talks about going into all of the nations of the world starting at home and spreading out to everywhere. But as I was preparing, I began to read a little bit from some of the books that we have um, that have been prepared. And there are many that talk about the missionary's life. This one in particular talks about the Brethren in Christ's first start into global missions. And it shares vignettes and stories. And it includes actual letters from people who are the first missionaries to head and to give their life into God's work overseas and in different places. I have copies, there's copies in the library, and they're fascinating, fascinating stories of what people went through and some of the things that they did. But before we get there, I want to look at a passage of scripture this morning, and then I'm going to share a little bit with you about what we do. I want to look at what may seem like a strange passage, thinking about global work, and that is Ezekiel chapter 47. I'm going to invite you to turn with me. If you have your own Bible, you can find Ezekiel right after Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and then Ezekiel, or you'll find it on page 869 in the red Bibles in front of you. But Isaiah 47. As we're turning there, this passage is in the middle of a book. Isaiah was a prophet. It's one of the major prophets. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. It's major only because it's big in size. Now, we need to kind of place it a little bit because we're jumping in right near the end of the book. Isaiah was a prophet who was speaking to the people in Babylon, the Jewish people or the Hebrew people that had been taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. They had been led off. And the book, probably from start to finish, is approximately 27 years worth of Ezekiel's life as prophet. So it's a long, long time frame there. Not as long as some of the others, but it's a good chunk of time. In the beginning of Ezekiel, he talks about why they left, the things that they were doing that were ignoring what God was asking them to do. It talks about this, the way that they got hauled at, off into captivity in the middle And we know this from the history of this time frame, that it was about 10 years after the Babylonians came, they took some of the people into captivity, and they left some others there with other leaders, but they still didn't behave well um, for the Babylonians, and they didn't turn their life around for God either. The Babylonians came back, destroyed all of Israel, all of Jerusalem, including the temple. So God's temple was destroyed, and we can read about that from Ezekiel's perspective a little earlier in the book. And then we get near the end, chapters 40 through 46, talk about how God is going to restore them, how he's going to bring them back. And really it talks in those six chapters, uh, God gives Ezekiel a vision for how he's going to rebuild the city and the temple and restore um, his place and position within the people at that time. And then here in verse, verse 47, it reread how Ezekiel is then taken outside of the walls. And so the, the earlier chapters talk about a big restoration of what's going on in the city. And here he begins to look outside. In essence, he's, God says that I have more for you than just restoring your place in your city and your temple. There's more for us than just a rebuilt city. So I'm going to read through these 12 verses, and then we're going to look at them together. Verses 1 through 12. So Ezekiel chapter 47 says, The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. When he had brought me out out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east and the water was flowing from the south side as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep he measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep he, me- he measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, and now it was a river that I could not swim across, because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, 
Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Areba, where it enters the sea. When, he em- when it empties into the sea, the water be- there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live there wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish. Because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh, so where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to an Eglum, and there will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh, for they will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kind will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will will nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Though fruit, their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. In the middle of this vision that Ezekiel is getting, he sees the restoration of all of the city and the temple and he's taken outside and he gets this picture of a river that begins to flow from the temple. Now, I want to walk through it with you again just a little bit. Uh, You can walk through it. I want you to picture it. Um, One of the radio guys, he used to say, picture it in the theater of your mind. And that's what I encourage you to do is just imagine with me what it would have been like for Ezekiel to come and stand and watch and see. Because Ezekiel was a prophet. He was someone who worshipped God. And he had been speaking to the people about how their temple, the place where God met with them, had been completely destroyed. And here God has given him a vision for how he's going to rebuild from the ground up the temple of God. And if you read through the vision, you see some amazing pictures there. In fact, I think it would be even better than it was before if it had been rebuilt exactly the way this vision had uh, come to Ezekiel. You can imagine the glory, the joy on his face as he stood there with this man from God who was giving him this vision and walking around the city as it would look like as God restored it. And then he takes him outside the gates. He takes him outside the gates of Jerusalem, a city built on a hill with no river that runs through it. But yet there is a river that begins to flow from the threshold of the temple. It says it came from the south side, just under the altar, just under the temple. If you put it on top of a map and lay it out, just south of the altar was a place where there would be a big tub of water. And in some scriptures it's referred to, literally it translates as the sea. It was a place where the priests would go to cleanse themselves ceremonially, to wash off all of their blemishes and all of their dirt before they put on their priestly robes to do worship to do the sacrifices and from this spot just south of the altar there is a pool under the threshold that gathers and begins to flow out slowly from the temple and it flows out from the temple out through the south gate heading eastward and as Ezekiel goes and follows it from there he knows that he's heading into a wasteland and into desert where nothing grows and it sucks up everything that it's given It starts out, this river is just a couple of inches, ankle deep, it says. But they keep following it. They follow it for about half a kilometer. And at that point, they measure again, and it gets a little bit deeper up to their knees. It's growing as this water flows through a desert wasteland, away from some place that doesn't have any water in it to begin with. It should be sinking, it should be sucked up by the dirt that it's flowing over, by the sand that it's running through, but yet it grows bigger and deeper. And they keep walking, and they get another kilometer away from the temple, and the water is now stronger and deeper, and it's about waist high. When I picture this, I picture what it's like to walk out into the lake when you're camping. And you begin, you feel the water on your feet, and as you walk in, it goes up, and it's deeper, it's stronger, it's bigger, wading through. And they keep going, about another half a kilometer, 
And now the water is too much. It's over their heads. It's too big. And in fact, he says, no one is able to cross over to the other side. And then that question in verse 6, where the man of God that's leading Ezekiel on this vision, he says, he stops, he pauses, he says, do you see this? You have to wonder, what is it that this man that was wanting to make sure that Ezekiel sees? I think he wants Ezekiel, and I think I want all of us to understand that there is something great happening within this passage, that starting at the temple and starting at that place where God dwells flows a stream that starts out small and ends up being something that no one would be able to encompass, no one would be able to cross or swim across. A city with no river from which water flows that gets increasingly bigger as it goes through the dry wasteland There's no rain, there's no tributaries, there's no other streams feeding into this. But yet it grows and it spreads. But it's not over. He begins to then describe the banks of the river with trees in great number all the way down to the Areva, which is the Jordan Valley, and into the sea. This would be the Dead Sea is where it is flowing. And as the water flows from the temple through the wasteland into the Jordan River and down into the Dead Sea, trees grow up around it. And not only do trees go up around it, but the Dead Sea itself, a water that is ten times saltier than any ocean, that has no living life in it, that many would refer to as a toxic water, becomes teeming with life where fishermen can stand shoulder to shoulder hauling in their catch all day long, where the trees that are around it are filled with so much fruit that there is enough for everyone, and where their leaves provide healing for those in need, never withering and never failing. From a dry wasteland to a sea which was dead and to a beautiful, fruitful collaborative, communal, life-giving, hope-filled land. I'm sure Ezekiel, as he is seeing this happen, he can picture what happens at this lake. That just north of the Dead Sea is the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus will come and do much of his ministry. As it flows, the water flows from there down, Through the Jordan Valley, it ends up in a place that just completely kills off everything. And yet it comes to life. Wherever it flows, it changes. And it transforms the world around it. The Brethren in Christ, our denomination that we're part of, is an old group moved into Canada about 1780. And within a 100 years, through the influence of various people and various movements, they couldn't stay still. They had traveling revival meetings across the United States and Canada. They couldn't be contained by the walls of their meeting place anymore. And at one point I read they had up to 14 different tents and speakers who would travel and set up meetings all over the United States. And in the late 1800s, they began to consider foreign mission work as well. In this book, which is the first of a series of uh, uh, three books, it tells the story of a lady named Rhoda Lee, who stood on the floor of an annual conference that they had in 1984. Sorry, that should be 1884. In 1884. And she went up to the front, unannounced, and it wasn't planned, And she stood there and she gave a bold speech about God's heart for lost people, for people who don't know him. And she began to speak and describe some of the things that God had laid on her hearts. And really, she spoke of a place that was a dry land where there was no spiritual fruit, where there was spiritual corruption, and where it was void of vibrant life. 
And she said, it's our responsibility to do something. And by the end of this four-day conference, there was an older man who was there, who he stood up and he said, you know, we have been charged with something that we need to do something about. And so he walked up to the front of the room with a $5 bill and laid it on the altar. And that was the start of their mission fund. Many, many others followed. And within two years, the first missionaries were set off, sent off to Japan in 1896. A year later, five more headed into Africa. A couple of years after that, in 1898, four were sent into India. And in this book, you can read their stories, and they actually have pictures in the back of some of the letters that they penned in their own hand and sent home to their family members. And you can see these stories. At that time, in the Brethren in Christ Church, we used to have a magazine, um, a journal. It was called the Evangelical Visitor. And such, uh, in that time, the, the life of the church was shared with others throughout this monthly magazine that would be sent out to the different church members. And so many of these articles and the stories that were written were written to home, people at home and were shared throughout the denomination in that magazine. And you can follow those stories as you read through the archives. And at one of the meetings, years later, of missionaries from the Brethren in Christ, from those that were on furlough and those that were preparing to be sent out onto the mission field, there was a speaker, the story tells in this book. A speaker who had come, he was from Thailand, born and raised there, but came to Christ through um, heading to school in the United States. But he had worked alongside of Brethren in Christ missionaries in the country of Thailand, in Bangkok. And he was invited to come and share with these missionaries. And when he got up to share with them, he read to them Ezekiel chapter 47, the verses that we just read together. And he said how, or what the story tells us is how these missionaries were compared with the flowing of waters. How it said that you, as you go out there, are helping to swell the river. One missionary wrote, and these are her words, tears welled up as we saw our own individual parts in submitting to the flow and going where and how the Lord carried us to bless the nations. She went on to say that this is a sacred moment. As they put themselves in the place of Ezekiel, standing in the water and being willing to see what God will do. So she talked about a swelling of the water. Because the passage we read in Ezekiel 47 doesn't make sense, does it? From a city on the top of a hill with no water, no river running through it, how does a water, a river begin to flow out? And not only that, if we were to take a garden hose and if I were to bring it and spray it across the room and I were to go a few feet, the water doesn't get thicker, does it? It's the same amount of water no matter how far it runs or how far it travels. Yet this river got deeper and got wider, it got bigger, and it gave life at the same time. How do we go from a small trickle that started really ankle-deep water coming out of the temple? There's not much to write home about, right? but it turned into a big flood, if you will. And these missionaries, as as they were being shared with at this meeting, they understood that the way that you get the water to swell is you step into it. It's a water that gives life. It's a water that keeps giving. And as it touches dry and parched souls, it doesn't dry up. In fact, those people that are touched and the life that is given from this water that flows from the temple, it gives even more life as it goes. It never gets dried up. And the more life that it brings, the bigger it gets. As you meet with Jesus, the one who gives life, we know that it doesn't take away from God. 
It only adds to what He does and what He can do through us. As the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, you can keep wading in deeper, knowing that it doesn't ever end. He only gets more of you, and you get more of Him. As we start small, there's always a deeper place to go. At the church here, we have people who are involved in mentoring one-on-one with others. We have small groups that happen throughout the year in Bible studies and prayer meetings. In small beginnings, with a handful of people, great things can happen. The early brother in Christ sent a handful of missionaries around the globe. Many of them never returned home again. Many of them gave their life in the first years and died of disease and sickness and other things. It's a moving story to read how there was one family from the the United States who they had eight children. Four of them were called into foreign mission work and were some of those first missionaries to be sent out around the globe. And all four of them gave their life on the mission field, when most of them, along with their spouse, if they were married. Some even children. And you would think that it was a failure. But the power that is available, the Spirit of God that we have, the water that flows and gives life and healing and increases from a small trickle, that turns into a big flood and goes beyond what we can ever ask or imagine. From this meager beginnings and often fail often in failure. And from a heart of people who loved God so much that they placed everything, including their lives and the lives of their children, into his hands, they knew that God had something bigger in store. I thought about reading some passages from here of a daughter who went and um, her husband had died from malaria in Africa. And she wrote a letter home to her parents. By the time that letter would have went, got home, she had passed away as well. And then there's a response from the parents that comes back as well. Uh, But I decided I didn't want to cry this morning. But it's phenomenal to see the way that they speak about how good God was to them, even in the midst of those very, very difficult circumstances. But we can see when we look around, with over 100 years of history, what has happened now. And in the first place they would have ended up and started, which is now Zimbabwe, was founded in 1898, was the first time missionaries landed into the country that's now Zimbabwe. And they have currently approximately 287 congregations with over 42,000 members. And those are members of the church, not attenders. Their average attendance is much higher than that. In Zambia, where Jamie and I and the boys were blessed to go, they were founded, founded there in 1906. And currently they have over 200 congregations with close to 20,000 members. In both of these countries, our church that started in these countries with a few people that went and gave their life now includes not only a church where ministry is done, but hospitals, clinics, schools, and Bible school, pastoral training institutions. In many ways, they are leading nationally in so many different areas that people look at them in these countries for as a resource where they can learn and grow. We got to tour the leading malaria research facility in the world, and it's in the same village that was the first founded in 1906 in Matcha. This Malaria Research Institute is now a joint partnership with the Brethren in Christ Church and John Hopkins University and another university in England, I believe. And they have trained up um, all local people. The head researcher is a lady from England. 
and then all of the other master's level researchers are Zambians who have gone and got degrees and have come back to the school to do the malaria research on their own. Anyone who studied mosquitoes and the diseases that they carry will have been at this institute in Zambia. It's the world's best. And it started in the place where we sent a few people over 100 years ago. We have people in South Africa. They've only been there since 1988. But there are 15 congregations with over about 1,400 members. We now have churches in Mozambique as well with almost 100 congregations and 8,000 members. And we've been there since 1990. And they were planted by the church in Malawi. In Malawi, we have 46 congregations with 5,000 members. And then we also have, now have churches in Botswana and in Kenya. The Botswana church was an outreach of the Zimbabwe BIC church. And the Kenyan church was a group of people looking for some place that they could um, grow and thrive and that they could come alongside of, that could come alongside of them. And they became part of the Brethren in Christ Church in 2010, just six years ago. And there's about 25 congregations and 5,000 members. A small trickle turns into a huge work. And I gave you just a glimpse of what we are doing globally. We're not talking about Cuba or Nicaragua or Venezuela, Mexico, India, Nepal. In those Indian and Nepal, they have um, hostels, the spice homes for girls who need a safe place to stay while they study and go to school. We have churches in Honduras and throughout the Middle East in countries that you'll never find the name of um, because they are closed countries, but yet we have missionaries at work in there. And to keep them safe, we don't talk about where they are. And not just within missions work, but in peace and justice work through the start of MCC, which we just had the relief sale yesterday. That's why I thought I'd mention it. But we were founding members along with 15 other Mennonite and Amish bodies in 1920. Started the work of MCC in relief and service and peace work around the globe. And then within our own country, there's been significant work um, through church plants, our first plants in eastern Canada and a denomination that is growing both in size and in influence. A small trickle turning into a big flood. Now for you and me, I think these are kind of cool things. When you read the stories and you see the lives that were changed, and then you can look back and see what has happened because of their faithfulness to step in. The questions that I ask myself and that I want to ask you to think about, to respond to, are these. First, have you dipped your toes in the water? It starts off just ankle deep, but it's a water that cleanses, that comes from the temple. It's a water that gives life and hope. In John chapter 4, Jesus met with a woman at a well who had come midday to draw water. She was one who was ashamed of her life, of the wrong turns it had taken. And Jesus said to her, likely thinking of this passage, The water I give to you will become in you a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It washes clean eternally. Have you dipped in your toes? And if you haven't, don't wait another day. It's amazing that feeling of walking from dry and parched land to stepping into refreshing, cool water. To go from a place where you live without hope full of worry and concern and uncertainty about your future and your eternity to all of a sudden realize that you have now stepped into hope, love, acceptance, freedom, and forgiveness. Don't wait. And if you have dipped your toes in, my question for you is, how wet are you? 
Are you at your ankles or your knees? Have you gone up to the waist yet? Have you given over total control and been swept off your feet? The deeper you go, the more wet you get. And you need to remember that the deeper you go, the bigger it gets too. You get more of God and He gets more of you. The waters spread the more that they go. The, more, the deeper you go. You can't... I've talked with people who are, have um, trouble maybe seeing or picturing or understanding that the more God gives, it doesn't mean that He has less to give. He can keep giving everyone everything and it will never run dry so your life in Christ is important because it adds to the deepening of the waters when God gets more of you you get more of God this passage in Ezekiel that spurred on many many different missionaries it spurred them on because they wanted to see the waters of the global church grow they wanted to see dry, wasted land turned into lands that were full of fruit and trees and fish that could be caught unending as the fishermen stood shoulder to shoulder. They saw a vision just like Ezekiel of what God could do. So have you dipped your toes in? How deep are you and how are you adding to that river? Who are you fishing for? Some of you may not be sure. Some of you may be wondering if God may be calling you to something here or even around the world. And these are calls that we need to explore and we need to answer. Some of you may be called to meet with your neighbor next door. We've already talked about Muslims. Maybe they will be out tonight before sundown and you will have a chance to visit to meet with them God calls us to step in faith you know this passage is also used to speak of revival of the spirit of God of the source of power but it all comes from him so have you dipped your toes in how deep are you And how are you adding to that river? I want to just close us in prayer today as we finish. I would invite you to um, stand with me as we close this morning. And as we pray, I want to give opportunity for people to respond if they want, just with a raise of a hand or stepping out into an aisle. If they want more of God, if they want answer to a call that they're not sure where it will lead, or if they want to step out for the first time and dip your toes in the water, I'll give opportunity for each of those, but let's pray together as a sending off this morning and just come before God and respond to him based on this passage today. Father, we are grateful that we can come here this morning and open up your word together. We are grateful that your word provides life and insight and learning opportunity for us to get to know you better. And this morning, as we talked about a vision that you gave many, many generations ago to Ezekiel, we recognize that it's something that you still do today. There still is a water that comes from you. We have access to because of what Jesus did. That we can step into it and be cleansed and forgiven. That we can be filled with the empowering of your spirit we can wade in deeper and deeper and give over to you. The water that brings great healing to dry and parched lands and to dry and parched souls. So this morning, we just come before you. And God, there may be some here who want to dip their toes in for the first time. 
And if that's you, I invite you just to acknowledge that by raising a hand and saying, God, I want to come into your healing and forgiving waters. We also invite you, if you want to step in deeper and get more of God in your life, to raise your hand and acknowledge that too, that you want more and more to step in deeper and deeper. God, we're so grateful for the work that you're doing in lives here today. And maybe there are some who are curious, who are wondering, who have um, prayers and concerns about where you want them to be. God, I just ask that for those people that you would give them guidance and instruction and give them opportunity to work it through with your body. So this morning, Father, for those that raise their hand that they want to step into the water, I lift them before you and ask that you would meet with them. For the many more who raise their hand saying that they want more of you, I ask that you would pour out your blessing upon them and your spirit upon them. And for those that are wondering what the next step will be in their life, God, I ask that you would grant them wisdom and insight. God, we thank you for this opportunity today. In Jesus' name, amen. So may God bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you as you leave, and may you not get actually wet, but may you feel his spirit poured upon you throughout the week. God bless, and have a wonderful week.